Well, welcome once again to uh, our continuing study of this doctrine of the election of grace, our predestination, what is meant to be a, a great and glorious comfort and consolation for us. Uh, and as we've said before, uh, if it is not, uh, if it causes uh, concern and despair, then we're doing it wrong. We want to be guided by what God gives in his word and has delivered to us in Christ here in time, that from the foundations of the earth, uh, this is what he has uh, uh, predestined for us, and then in time, in the hearing of the word, in our baptism, at the supper, as the absolution is proclaimed and the word of God and his comfort is, is preached, uh, we have the, the giving of what he had foreordained for us, predestined, elected us, his choosing. Let's begin with prayer, and then we'll uh, uh, get back into our, uh, our uh, fourth episode here of our, of our study. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant us a steadfast faith in Jesus Christ, a cheerful hope in your mercy, and a sincere love for you and one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> I, I thought I would begin uh, uh, today uh, making some comparisons, uh, and you know, uh, taking a look at what various churches, denominations, this can be very helpful, very instructive, and, and sometimes, uh, unfortunately, kind of chilling, and, and how they talk about uh, predestination or the election uh, of, of uh, grace uh, by which God chooses us in his mercy. Uh, and uh, you know all major religions and philosophies, uh, you know, have to take up these these issues of you know God's will and uh, the question of the future. You know, who knows? Uh, and uh, and also about uh, uh, human freedom, uh, the freedom of the will or the lack of freedom of, of the will. Uh, and of course, based on uh, the Holy Scriptures, which has been our focus, that's the way we get it right. You know, we can actually hear from God's own mouth in his word uh, what this predestination is, this election is, and what it isn't. And we dare not speak. We don't want to speak because there lies trouble for us uh, when we go off uh, or try to crawl into the mind of God and think, oh, I've, I've got the answer to that question of uh, why are some saved and not others saved? Uh, no, we don't have the answer to that question. And to, to look at a couple of... Uh, 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 Christian uh, church bodies, large, large. You know, I guess we can think kind of of denominations. Uh, uh, what they say by their own words. I'm not going to be putting words into anybody's mouth, but to, to kind of look at what they say. A, a good place for us to start would be to see what uh, uh, the uh, uh, what the Lutherans say. Uh, and uh, we had actually read this at the very beginning of our study. It's just a, a portion from uh, one of our confessions and the uh, the formula of Concord. Uh, where, and, and listen, I hope you already appreciate how, how beautiful and comforting this is uh, from, the, from the Lutheran point of view. God's word leads us to Christ, who is the book of life, in whom all are written and elected, who are to be saved in eternity. For it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, even as he chose us in him, that is, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, this choosing by God before anything even is. And uh, we this reference back to Ephesians 1, where we, where we spent a, a good amount of time, Ephesians 1, verses uh, 3 through 14. Uh, if you forgot, go back again and hear it. Uh, that language of before the foundation of the world, before there is anything, he elects, he chooses. And then in time and history, what he has foreordained and predestined in, in, uh, uh, in eternity, before there is anything, there is only God and his love, uh, uh, he then causes to be. He, it, it happens. It takes place for us through his means, through his word, by his spirit, through the sacraments. Here is where God is and where I may be certain of his will and his disposition of love towards me. Uh, uh, looking at the uh, the Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, when you first hear this, this is, you know, you go, oh, it, it, it speaks in a, a very good way. It, it mentions, of course, predestination. They, they believe in that. 
but listen for what is not there. I guess that's kind of a, a negative hearing. But uh, uh, based on what we've been talking about and how that preposition of, you know, in him, in Christ, this is taking place in Christ, the incarnate Son of God who is given for us and for our salvation. Here's what the Eastern Orthodox uh, say. This is uh, from their longer catechism of the, of the Eastern Church, uh, questions 120 and 21, if, you, uh, if you've got that at home. Uh, it says, with what design did God create man? With this, that he should know God, love, and glorify him, and so be happy forever. Has not that will of God by which man is designed for eternal happiness, its own proper name in theology, it is called predestination of God. And why I like the idea that it's, it, it, it focuses us on the, uh, that we are to be happy forever, uh, 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 we are designed for eternal happiness, that we are God's own, uh, you'll notice what is missing there is and I think it's a rather sad miss. I mean, this is, it's fine for what it says, but it misses Christ. There's no in him there. That what God predestined from the foundations of the world, he has now carried out and is carrying out for us, for our consolation, for our hope in the midst of these crosses and trials. In Christ. And you know where he is, where he's placed himself for us. In his in His means, not something we've devised, but his means of grace, uh, his word and sacrament. Uh, uh, from, uh, <clears throat> from the Reformed uh, point of view, this, is, this one's kind of chilling. Uh, this one comes from the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, so this is, uh, this is pretty strict Calvinist. This comes out of the, 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 the history there and uh, uh, a confession of the, uh, of the Church of England, very Presbyterian, you know, their whole Civil War and uh, all the, the things that uh, uh, transpired there at, uh, at one point. This is from uh, 1646. And boy, this is where you're going to hear that, that, that uh, uh, terrifying uh, word of, of Calvin about this God predestinating some, uh, predestining some to, to damnation. Here it is uh, from the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, uh, chapter 3.3. By the decrees of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life. Oh, all right. And others foreordained to everlasting death. Now, notice again there, there's, there's nothing about Christ. There's just this sovereign God, this all-powerful, omnipotent God, which indeed he is. But if you have not brought in Christ and the cross and what he has done for sinners, then you simply have God, and as, as uh, the Lutherans speak of this and, and rightly criticize it as unbiblical. So it's almost as though God is, you know, has a, 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 a muster uh, where he's uh, you know, saying, okay, you come, you're saved, you're over here. No, no, not so fast, you over there. And, and uh, you go to hell, you go to heaven, you go to hell. And there's, you don't need Christ in that situation at all. You don't need Christ in that theology. He is absent. You just have this sovereign, all-powerful God making these decisions, predestining some to heaven, predestining some to hell. And that is a, that's double predestination. That tries to speak, that says way too much and says way beyond what God says in his word. Uh, that's a, the old Calvinist uh, uh, viewpoint uh, uh, that, that creeps in here and there. It's tough to find folks who, who probably still hold to that, but uh, I'm sure there are. Uh, here from uh, the Roman Catholic Church, they also take this up in their uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. They're a big, thick uh, book, uh, and you'll see what direction they they go off on this as well, as they say uh, uh, that the the perfectly purified elect. So they they use that language of the elect. The perfectly purified elect can go directly to heaven when they die. And then a couple paragraphs later, it says, the imperfect elect. So they, they are the elect, but they're not perfected yet. Something is lacking in them. The imperfect elect must spend time in purgatory. So here is brought in this kind of figment of purgatory, which is you know, uh, uh, an unbiblical idea. It's kind of been built in, and the nature of the Roman church is, once they've got it, they have to kind of stay with it and keep on promoting it. 
probably difficult to find many Roman Catholics who would uh, be able to speak much about purgatory, but it's this idea that uh, 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 one can never be certain if one has been saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, the way St. Paul speaks about it. Uh, uh, and the idea there is uh, if you don't have enough grace being infused in, this is, it has to do with their definition of, of grace rather than God's declaration of uh, where he imputes you, uh, 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 bespeaks you, uh, considers, confers upon you his righteousness by his grace, and therefore you are righteous. There, uh, and there's, this is, uh, uh, you know, going into the, 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 uh, uh, the cobwebs of history as to why they kind of ended up this, in this kind of sad going off the track here. They view grace as this uh, uh, thing which is kind of infused into you. And so you, you have to, you, you get the, uh, somebody says a mass for you, you do the works that, that uh, God gives you some grace and it gets, you, you, you get a higher quantity of, of grace in yourself. And then you are able to do the good works uh, by which God will say, okay, good. Now you are uh, uh, perfectly purified. Uh, but if you're not perfectly purified, if you're imperfectly uh, uh, purified or the imperfect elect, you have to cool your jets in purgatory for, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of years or however their catalogs, which are, of course, purely generated out of thin air and, and made up. Uh, it, it's very sad and tragic. This it leads to what we would, uh, you know, what Luther would always speak of as this, this monster of uncertainty, which is, uh, we, we kind of uh, went back on that uh, a couple episodes ago, where the idea that one cannot be certain, you don't want to tell people that their sins are forgiven, uh, that they're saved by grace, because if you do that, they're not going to do good works anymore. Uh, so you always have to kind of keep them uh, uh, guessing, keep them a little off balance, uh, so that they keep on coming back, do good things, and uh, you know that'll help people. Uh, and so there's no certainty. Uh, there's only uncertainty when it comes to how God is disposed towards us, which really kind of undoes the proclamation of the gospel, which is to bring this comfort and consolation. And God intends it for such. That's what the doctrine of the election of grace is all about, for our comfort and our rejoicing, as we'll hear more about today. I suppose we could say, for the, for the great many of just pure, sadly liberal churches, which have kind of thrown out the scriptures altogether, they don't have a lot to say uh, and certainly nothing uh, with certainty to say about what God's word says about predestination. Uh, they, they would say, well, scripture is just a, a, a man-made book, a collection of uh, uh, different schools of thought over history, uh, edited together, uh, and, uh, and it's unreliable. So uh, we'll use our smarts and our, our uh, philosophizing and uh, uh, whatever comes down the pike and whatever sounds good today. We'll, we'll, if that comforts you, great. If it doesn't, uh, 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 too bad. Uh, so uh, there lies uh, the terrible monster of uncertainty uh, as well. Uh, but again, hearkening back to what we heard in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, uh, he chose us. You know, God chose us in him, in Christ. You know, what is acted out in time and history through the incarnate Son of God, the Word that becomes flesh and dwells among us, who dies upon the cross, who is raised from the dead, who is ascended to fill all things, and even now, where two or three are gathered in his name, well, there he is doing what he promises to do, uh, bringing us forgiveness, life, and salvation. In him, you were chosen before the foundation of the world, uh, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So there's a, just a bit of a, a sample and a comparison uh, uh, and the great distinctions between uh, you know how this gets lived out in, in the life of, of Christians and how sad that is where, where, where we do go away from the clear voice of God and his word. Uh, uh, boy, there's no comfort there. Uh, the gospel, uh, we see Christ being removed uh, altogether and there's no comfort there for us. Um, there is a, uh, uh, you probably know a little bit of this ditty. This is a old, uh, an old, uh, uh, uh rhyme. It was kind of meant in, in, to express the frustration of people, uh, as they were trying to deal with the, the doctrine of particular election. You've probably heard the phrase, you're, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. That kind of suggests that, uh, doesn't matter. You know, it's kind of a fatalistic approach of things. If you do it, 
you're damned. If you don't do that thing, well, you're damned too. So, you know, why, why bother? But here's the, uh, 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 the couple of lines here, and you, maybe, you've, maybe you've heard uh, at least part of this. You shall and you shan't. You will and you won't. You will be damned if you do, and you will be damned if you don't. And so this, this little rhyme, again, it's Lorenzo Dow, D-O-W. Uh, this was a, a criticism, uh, uh, meant to be, I guess, slightly amusing, uh, of the teaching of a particular election, this double predestination, or the idea that, that only a certain number are predestined, and probably not you or, or you or, or you. Uh, uh, and th those, folks, uh, th those folks will be damned. Uh, uh, and the complaint uh, uh, that is that you that comes out here is that uh, uh, you know everyone is told to you know believe the gospel. The gospel, you know, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. I mean, this is to be for all people. You ought to believe this. Uh, uh, but if you are not one of the elect, if you are not one of the elect, this thinking goes, and, and you can see with the, the just falling off the cliff here. If you are not one of the elect. And you hear and believe the gospel, it doesn't matter. If you're not one of the elect, you're damned if you do believe. Of course, you're, you're damned if you don't believe. So, I mean, the, the little rhyme might have been written in, in uh, uh, fun, but it's, uh, it expresses a, a sincere and serious frustration. Um, in predestination, God has appointed the elect persons for obedience to him. And th that is, you know... A healing of our brokenness, our our our, the, our hostility to God that comes from sin as disobedient sinners, uh, so we can trust and and serve God. And in predestination, we're also appointed for an application uh, for ourselves of Jesus's atoning blood. And I mean real blood, the blood of Christ, the blood of the man Jesus, which is shed for us upon the cross and shed for the sins of the world. Uh, that which covers our sins. Uh, uh, and, and we know the results that come from this. We, we spoke that, uh, boy, if we take God's promise here seriously, you know, all the benefits that, for which we have been chosen and elected, the, the forgiveness of sins, this holiness, this blamelessness that God gives by the work of his spirit, the, the fact that uh, the, the gift of faith by which we may cling to this with joyful certainty and rejoice in it, uh, this uh, adoption that we have, that we are brought into this family of God, uh, this very specific way through the hearing of the gospel in our lives, through the application uh, of the gospel in holy baptism, and in the ongoing life of the believer, the life of the divine service, you know, living the liturgy by which we hear the, the, the absolution and the proclamation. We talked about that in Ephesians chapter 3, where uh, you know, Paul talks about when, when you heard, because there was a time and there are hopefully many, many times a continuation, time upon time, when you are hearing about what God has ordained from the foundations of the earth before, before the creation, before there's anything, he elected you. And then in time, in created time in history, his time for sure, he sends his son to, to accomplish the salvation. And in time, he also then brings it and applies it to us through his means of grace. Uh, uh, take a look at, uh, uh, today we want to spend our time in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we'll, uh, 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 we'll it, it's, it's kind of a marvelous thing. I guess I hadn't realized this before until I had looked into it. Just as we were looking at uh, the Apostle Paul, the, uh, the, the Jewish Paul, who is, becomes the apostle to the, the Gentiles, to, to the nations, uh, as he is appointed by the Christ. Here is the apostle Peter, uh, 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 the Jewish fisherman, who is uh, kind of seen as the apostle to the Jews, although uh, he has a great many dealings with the, uh, the Gentiles as well. But uh, here in, the, in 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, in, in language which is marvelously uh, similar to, I mean, the, 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 the doctrine is the same, of course. Peter doesn't speak uh, a different doctrine or word than, than, Jesus, or than, uh, than Paul, uh, and Paul doesn't speak differently than, than Peter. Uh, and they both speak what is given to them from, uh, uh, from God. But uh, 
Uh, even the language that we'll get to here, there's this, you know, it's kind of a beatitude, this blessed be. That's how Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 started out in that beautiful, long, long uh, kind of blessing prayer, a Trinitarian prayer, you know, speaking of, of what the Father does and what the Son does and what the Holy Spirit uh, is doing in bringing us uh, the Son of the Father as he adopts us uh, and, and uh, gives us our inheritance. But uh, in 1 Peter uh, uh, chapter 1, uh, even this this language of uh, uh, if, if you just we won't spend as much time up there, but the little greeting there at the uh, at the top of the letter uh, tells us who's writing. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles, you know, you are chosen. He's writing to the the churches of these folks who have been uh, dispersed, uh, uh, presumably through various persecutions, and here as Satan tries to stomp down and destroy. Uh, the Christian confession, well, the, the blood of those martyrs is the seed of the church. The church keeps on spreading. The very uh, opposite of what Satan intends uh, is done. Uh, and, and God uses, uh, 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 even works through the evil that Satan uh, wishes to, to bring upon the church for the furtherance and for the blessing of the church and the spread of the gospel. And more people are brought into uh, the holy Christian church. Uh, but he, he's uh, to the elect exiles, uh, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, there's that, that foreknowledge, uh, in the sanctification of the Spirit, so the, you've got the Father mentioned and the Spirit mentioned, for obedience to Jesus Christ, yeah. blessed Holy Trinity, the Father, uh, the sanctification of the Spirit, or obedience to Jesus Christ, for sprinkling with his blood. Now there's, that's a, that's baptismal language, but but blood is is the real thing here. That's uh, uh, this you know gritty reality that again what God foreordained, what God uh, uh, designed for us before the foundations of the uh, uh, the world uh, comes upon us through ultimately through the sprinkling of His blood, that which pays for our sins. But I, what I really want to look at is kind of the, the verses. Uh, uh, three and following, and this is where I think this is a magnificent comparison to what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter one, verse three and following. Well, here's Peter in uh, uh, his first epistle, uh, beginning uh, very similarly and in in, in exultant praise, because this is a great thing to be able to speak about. It uh, even in the midst of our trials and temptations, which Peter acknowledges, uh, he speaks about. Uh, uh, this uh, this brings us to rejoice with joy uh, that we see the outcome of uh, our faith, which God has created in us, the salvation of our souls. But uh, let's take a look and we'll make a few comments here. But uh, beginning at verse 3 of 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, listen for the Trinitarian uh, language here. God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Son, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. So he is the cause, and it's for us. He has caused us to be born again. There's baptismal language. This You must be born again by water and the Spirit. Uh, uh, you know, and again, the, these eternal events, God's eternal mercy, which is intended for you by his choosing of you, it's then grounded in, in history. And the events that have happened by God's doing through his means of grace for you. He has caused us to be born again. I am baptized. Born again. Born from above. Uh, born anew. To a, a living hope. Ah, that hope. This is not to a, a living despair or a living question mark hovering over our head as to, gee, I wonder how God is disposed towards me. No, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There again, a reference to a, this historical event, the thing that God has done that he had promised by the prophets and he has accomplished through his son, the salvation of our souls, the resurrection of Christ from the dead, from his crucifixion. Verse 4 to an inheritance, and there's that language, just like Paul used in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, this inheritance. You've been brought into the family. You are adopted. Uh, what has been, what is uh, for all the family uh, uh, of God is for you. 
to an inheritance. I mean, it's yours already, even if you don't always feel like you, you see all of it or it's all uh, unveiled for us. It is all present and for us, uh, even now, uh, uh, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Isn't that a great way to describe these things of God? It can't perish. Other things perish. You know, even gold, which we don't think of as someone, something that can perish, but it's part of the created world that's just going to be melted away, even as much as human beings value it. Uh, it's perishable, uh, undefiled, uh, with, with, a, uh, uh, with a creation that's fallen in sin and, and defiled, unclean. Uh, this inheritance. It's imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading, kept in heaven for you. You, you elect exiles of the dispersion, uh, not only the Christians that, that Peter was writing to in Pontus and Gal Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia, uh, but also uh, to you uh, who, are, uh, who are listening still to this word. Uh, uh, verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith, and he's acknowledging this salvation through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And we, we have it uh, full now, the, the full unveiling of everything that we have where we'll see all these things. But he's talking about it as a, it's a present possession. You know, uh, you have the inheritance because you are a, a member of the family. You are adopted uh, children of God. You are his beloved daughter. You are his beloved son. In Christ, uh, ready to be revealed in the last time. Does this describe us? Verse 6, in this you rejoice. Well, you ought to, because you have this living hope. You've been born again to this living hope, because Christ is risen. This is yours. In this you rejoice, of course, don't you? Though now, and here Peter acknowledges the reality of this side of heaven, our life uh, lived out in a, in a fallen world amidst our still fallen flesh, uh, even as we have been born again, and we are in Christ, in him, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Boy, I think he's describing us. He's certainly describing the, the first century church, but uh, acknowledging that, boy, as we did at the very beginning, that we, we are under the cross. We are amid all of this these uh, temptations and uh, here is this, this glorious doctrine of election, because uh, uh, you have been chosen for this, uh, by which, uh, which brings such comfort. Don't we lack comfort so many times? Worry and wonder about so many things, but here is this consolation, especially under the cross, the cross that you have picked up, as our Lord says, those who would come after me. Pick up your cross, your cross, uh, and and follow me. And uh, uh, and so here, from before the time of the world, God has uh, determined to to give us these gifts to grant you patience as you bear that cross, as the as the Christians in uh, Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia are uh, for uh, a little while. It might not seem like a little while uh, when it's your suffering, but uh, 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 nonetheless. Uh, as, as we are grieved by these various trials, God grants us patience. He gives consolation. He, he nourishes us. He uh, uh, gives us hope. He produces that outcome for us that would contribute to our salvation. How? By his means of grace, by the gospel preached, by your baptism, those places, those hearings of God's word. So uh, uh, verse 7 uh, the, after the, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the, the, tested genuine, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result, here's a result, in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I remember thinking that uh, I, don't think of as, I don't think of gold as something which perishes. I mean, Gold is that uh, that uh, uh, commodity that people you know that that safe harbor that doesn't lose its value so much. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, its price goes up and down, but when when uh, when paper money loses its value, you know, gold is uh, uh, that that safe harbor for for folks to to have something of value that uh, doesn't suddenly become worth nothing uh, uh, in heavy inflation. I was an econ major back in the day, so I, I still talk about monetary theory, but uh, uh, but Peter speaks in a way which, which might sound strange that that uh, uh, your faith more precious than gold. Uh, we think of gold as uh, uh, more permanent, but no, it's still an earthly thing. It's a created thing. It can be a very useful thing. It can be a very harmful thing if we if we uh, 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 pursue our lives by loving only it in place of the true God and, and chase it down. But uh, gold perishes, though it is tested by fire, just like uh, as our test, the genuineness of our faith is tested. Uh, so the result by this testing and these crosses and these various trials that, that are going on here now for for a little while, maybe it seems like a long little while, to the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ on the last day, the, the full unveiling. I mean, he is present now by his wherever his word promises. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. Lo, I am with you. Always, that's a pretty specific promise that is not broken, and it is true even now. But here we look forward to that full revelation of Jesus Christ, his coming on the clouds. And, and Peter acknowledges this to these folks, who, as he says, verse 8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice. He, amidst these trials and uh, 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 these, this little while of uh, crosses and temptations, uh, but still you believe and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls, the salvation won for you by Christ that was determined for us <laughs> and for you, even before the foundation of the world. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied, now he's speaking of the, the Old Testament prophets, this is what they were speaking about. This is why we can read Christ in the Old Testament, even if the prophets didn't have the full, the full unveiling or revelation at that time, they have the revelation of God. They prophesied about the grace that was to be yours. Uh, uh, and searched it. Uh, they searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating. Uh, and there, you now the, the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit which proceeds from the Father and the Son, uh, here uh, spoken of as the Spirit of Christ. So again, Peter, just like Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, is so thoroughly Trinitarian here. We read it fast, you kind of blow through those details. So don't. Read it, revel in it, roll around in it, that uh, uh, as the prophets, uh, you know, searched uh, and inquired carefully, let's, as we're studying, let's search, let's inquire carefully, uh, as they did, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Um, the, uh, we'll, we'll get back to that. Uh, in, in just a moment. But uh, what a marvelous uh, you know, Peter, like Paul, who would specify to the to the Ephesians, you know, when you first heard the gospel, there was a time in history when you first heard the gospel. And that was God bringing that to, to you, uh, what he foreordained, what he, uh, uh, before the foundations of the world, then he delivers to you. This is the uh, uh, the, the two sides of uh, the doctrine of election, the, the predestination coin, that what God determined in history, uh, which is for your salvation, uh, uh, he then carries out right where he says he will, in Christ, through his means of grace. And, uh, and that Peter, as he speaks of, the, uh, 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 of, of Jesus here a little bit later on, uh, look at verse, uh, verse 9. Uh, that you are, if you think of the, the catechism here, since we were just talking about uh, gold uh, and other things we find precious, that uh, I remember the second article of the creed, that uh, uh, we have been re and redeemed 
uh, not with gold or silver, the things we might find the most precious, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood. Again, blood, that gritty reality, that which was Christ, the eternal Son of God, who receives his, uh, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and receives through the Virgin Mary and is, and is made man, born of a woman, our brother this way, born in the same way that we are. And now with blood, and with the precious blood of Christ. This is, uh, excuse me, verse uh, 19 of 1 Peter chapter 1. With this, here's the, here's the currency that God uses. Blood. With the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. There's that language in Peter now that we find in Paul. But was made manifest. What does that mean? Showed himself. He, he became flesh. He was made in card. He was made manifest uh, in Bethlehem. He was made manifest in uh, a synagogue in Nazareth, even if people couldn't understand and say, well, that must be the Son of God. But God made manifest, and through the miracles, and through, ah, most especially, manifest through the crucifixion, through the atonement itself, through the shedding of the blood, made manifest in the last times of which we are in, for the sake of you. This is for you. These things are so certain for you. What God has done for sinners and the ungodly uh, does for us, for me, for you. Uh, verse 21, who through him, and there's, again, like the language of, there's a nice prepositional phrase, through him, just like we heard over and over again in Paul in Ephesians 1, you know, in him, in Christ, in him, uh, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So you have this all, purchased not with uh, gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, with his innocent sufferings and death. You know, this election is God's election, God's choosing, a special act of God's grace by which he uh, applies to us uh, the atoning blood of Jesus to the elect. And uh, uh, we, we hear from about the prophets who were searching these places out, looking in the Old Testament, the, the sacrificial system, the, the lamb that uh, was uh, uh, for the Passover. Uh, the lambs were for killing this, you know, perfect, without blemish, one-year-old uh, lamb that uh, whose uh, blood is shed and poured out, uh, and then the lamb that is eaten for the for the meal. All of these things pointing forward to the, the lamb of God. Who does what? He, he takes away the sins of the world, uh, as John the Baptist preaches, as we still sing uh, every week in the liturgy. Uh, uh, and this, <laughs> this is what, what God foreordained, what he, before the foundation of the world. Now you're hearing this, but you've heard this a couple times, just in, in, the, in this episode, uh, by which the word of the gospel now comes to us, regenerates us with this, this life of hope for joy by the healing and restoration that has been applied to you through the atonement, through the blood of the Lamb, uh, where God is uh, bringing uh, us to faith uh, uh, through Jesus as our Redeemer, that he, he's going to guard us in the faith. He's the, the good shepherd. Uh, what a marvelous image. No one can uh, uh, snatch us out of his hand. That's you know, John chapter 10, this picture of, a uh, nice picture of uh, of election there from the mouth of Jesus. No one may snatch them out of my hand. Now, if I'm in the hand and I'm trying to lean out as far as I can to see if I can just hang on by the, the tip of my toes, well, then uh, uh, then I may have a problem if I leap out or if I find a way to get out. But, but no one is coming in to snatch me out of Christ's hand. No one will snatch them out of his hand. Uh, these uh, predestined uh, actions will come to pass in the lives of Christians. And, uh, and uh, as Peter tells us, what is our reaction to this? Uh, knowing this, we react with joy and, and with praise and, and, and all love for the God who has done this, which then also results in, in the love for our neighbor. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll stop here for today and pick this up uh, uh, again, looking at and focusing on, on the work of Christ in this, what is foreordained is now carried out and is being carried out in this same Christ as he, through his means of grace, delivers all of this uh, to you.
for your certainty, for your, for your comfort, and for your consolation. Uh, but we'll stop there, and we'll, we'll see you next time.